on his description of what life in the kingdom looks like. And we are doing that through reading and reflecting on the Sermon on the Mount. So if you have your scripture, uh, if you've got your phone, turn with me to Matthew 5, specifically verses 33 through 37. And at this point, we're kind of in a short mini-series in which we're examining six of Jesus' antithetical statements. These are statements that begin with, you have heard it said, but I say to you. In each statement, Jesus affirms a command in the Old Testament and then extends it, offering a new application that gets to the heart of what Jesus wants to do. First, he commented on seething contempt and anger, and how whenever we harbor that anger against another, we dehumanize them. Then he talks about the second look, the look full of lustful intent that turns another into an object for our own sexual gratification. Then he condemns an easy divorce culture that oppresses women and weaponizes divorce. And today, he's just talking about truth-telling. So, if you thought you were going to get a break from anger, lust, and divorce, um, bad news, this might be the most difficult of these commands, and I'll get into that here in a moment. But would you stand with me for the reading of the scriptures? Jesus says, Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you did not make one hair white or black. Let what you say simply be yes or no, and anything more than this comes from evil. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We take a seat. If you didn't know, I'm going to tell you, one of the best shows to ever exist is a show called The West Wing. Yes. So, okay, Cassie's a fan. She introduced it to me. So, if you don't know, The West Wing is a political drama that details the ongoings of the West Wing of the White House and kind of all of the complications that go in with being the person or the people in charge. It's witty, it's funny, it's dramatic, it breaks your heart, it heals your heart, it does all the things a good TV show should do. It's kind of old, it's from, well, I say old, it's from the early 2000s, and I like put that in context. I'm from earlier than that. Um, so. It is an early 2000s show, but it is incredible. It's a great show. And there's this one particular episode where there is a presidential debate, and they introduced me to something I didn't know about called the spin room. Are you familiar with this phenomenon where the presidential candidates will debate, and then there will be a room off to the side for media personnel in which the candidates and their representatives will attempt to spin the comments or influence the comments in their candidate's favor. So if you watch the scene, it's full of chaos because when their candidate says something that they're like, why did you say it that way? They've got the, the job of kind of taking what they said and putting a spin on it so that it becomes a more favorable outcome. It's the spin room. And while it is prevalent in politics, I would like to argue that the spin is more prevalent than, than just in the political arena. We are surrounded by a culture of spin. We call it public relations, we call it marketing, we call it advertising, we call it a filter, we call it social media marketing, but so much of this is about taking the reality, the truths, and tweaking it just enough so that we bear a favorable image in the mind of whoever we're thinking of. Now, I'm not saying all of those things are wrong, but I am warning us to consider how those different techniques are training us to even think of ourselves in this way. To think of ourselves as images that need to be managed, or maybe another word is curated. 
Maybe the things that come from our mouths, the way that we describe ourselves, the way we describe how our week has been, is just slightly tweaked in order to put an image of ourselves that is different than reality. We live in a culture of spin. We live in a culture of curation. We live in a culture of hiding. For let's not call it anything other than what it is. It is an attempt to hide who we really are. And yet the great tension of this moment is we all so desperately long to be known. We all so desperately long to be known as our authentic selves. And yet we all perpetually have a habit to slightly distort the way we are being seen in order to hide our own vulnerabilities, to hide the things we're uncomfortable with admitting out loud. And although it was spoken over two millennia ago, Pontius Pilate's question animates so much of our own moment, what is truth, he says. And so Jesus speaks into a moment like our own, that had its own song and dance, that had its own spin devised to distort the truth. And so Jesus' comments right here on oath-taking and truth-telling speak into that moment and speak into his own culture's distortion of the truth. Pause for dramatic effect. <laughs> Unlike the previous statements, Jesus is not necessarily extending a specific command in this moment. Rather, he is challenging and prohibiting a practice of oath-taking that had developed. So, here's the backstory. We're all familiar with what is the second or third commandment, wherever you read it, it's kind of different, um, of you shall not take the Lord's name in vain. Now, I think it's a right application, but not necessarily the men's application, that we don't use the Lord's name with a curse word, or we don't slam our finger in the door and yell something about God. It's not necessarily the application that it's going for. Rather, what it is condemning or prohibiting is the usage or the oath-taking of the Lord's name with no intention to follow through. So it's the used car salesman that goes, I swear to God this is going to work, knowing for a fact it will not work the moment they take it off the wall. Moses is prohibiting that activity of using the Lord's name as a weapon in the mouth of the dishonest. He's saying you do not use the Lord's name as a weapon against your neighbor to say you need to do what I want you to do because I'm invoking the name of our creator. It's a method for manipulation of our neighbor. And Moses is prohibiting it. And so as Jesus tells us, the whole of the law and the prophet is summed up in love the Lord your God and love the, your neighbor as yourself. It is a prohibition against the manipulation of our neighbor by using the name of God. And so when Jesus steps on the scene in the first century, the Jewish community had developed a complex hierarchy let me tell you, I went down a deep, dark rabbit hole of the complex hierarchy that get around this command to not use the Lord's name in vain. So instead of using the Lord's name directly, they would appeal to things associated with God. So they would say something like, I swear by the heavens. I swear by the earth. I swear by the temple. I swear by the altar. I swear by the gift on the altar. That I am telling you the truth. The reality was this was just a loophole to get around when they were being devious. Going, but at least I didn't use the Lord's name in vain. It was a method of being dishonest. It was a method of distorting the truth and using the things associated with God Almighty to manipulate and strong arm someone into believing in what they were saying. Now Jesus, seeing through this manipulation, speaks directly. 
directly to this practice at the end saying, why are you appealing to all of these things? For there is not a thing that isn't a direct appeal to God. So he says, if you appeal to heavens, that is his throne. If you appeal to earth, that is his footstool. If you appeal to Jerusalem, well, that's his city. You can't even appeal to a hair on your head because you have no control over he is putting a direct stop to this practice of oath-taking and manipulation that was often an attempt to strong-arm our neighbor into doing something they didn't want to do. It was a method for distorting the truth and shielding themselves from the guilt associated with lying. And Jesus rightfully criticizes those with a loose commitment to truth by prohibiting oaths altogether and instructing his disciples to let their yes be yes and their no to be no. Now, as we talk about oaths, this is not necessarily something we have a ton of um, experience with. Um, there's, probably, there's maybe a few of you who have taken an oath in different things, but occasionally we'll hear something like, I swear to God, I swear on my mother's grave, I swear on the Bible. And these are somewhat misguided attempts to affirm that this moment in which I am practicing an oath, I have a deeper commitment to the truth than what I normally have. So if I were to take this Bible and say, I swear to tell the truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God, all of a sudden the expectation in this room is that the next moment I have a deeper commitment to truth than what I would have had if I texted you, I will be there. Yet Jesus is cutting to the heart of that, saying that we cannot be a people with mixed commitments to truth. That our hand on the Bible moment cannot be different than our text moment. That we can't be known as truth tellers at one scenario and flaky in the other. He is calling us to a deep abiding commitment to being a people of simple honesty. He's calling out the wrong distortion in which some statements are more truthful than others. So Jesus kind of hits at a culture and a theory of communication that suggests there's two types of statements. One statement that is accompanied by an oath that should be kept, and the other without an oath, in which we are less obliged to keep. And he cuts at the heart of these practices, calling us to be fully committed people to truth, whether in a courtroom or in a lunch meeting. We must be people of our word. For Jesus is casting a vision of a kingdom people who will no longer have a need for oath-taking or the structures of dishonesty because we will be people committed to the truth. The practice of oath-taking is only necessary in a world full of lies. The practice of saying, I swear on this or that, is only necessary if there are a people known to be dishonest. And Jesus says, in the body of Christ, in the people that are known by my name, there should be no need for oath-taking, because each of us will have a, an abiding commitment to simple honesty and being people of our word. So this brings us to two aspects of this command that are worth addressing separately. So buckle up. It's not going to be bumpy, but it's going to be deeper than you expected. Because honestly, as I approached this one, I was like, ah, ah, being honest, this is going to be an easy one. And the deeper I got into it, the more I was convicted of my own inaction and the own, my own ways I distorted the truth, which I'll bring up in a second. So the two aspects of Jesus' command that are worth addressing separately are truth-telling in our public lives or our political lives and truth-telling in our interpersonal communication in our interpersonal lives. So truth-telling in our public lives. So as we talk about oaths, one of the few places oaths 
are still practiced are in the public sphere. So oaths of office, courtroom oaths, oaths of enlistment, etc. Our political life is one of the few places these are still practiced. And there is a great tension because without equivocation, Jesus says, do not take an oath at all. So, if you find yourself called to a courtroom, elected to an office, or in a profession in which an oath is required, what do you do? What do you do with Jesus' prohibition? And this is where the church and scholars have been deeply divided for 2,000 years, and specifically two camps have emerged. And I'm going to take the time to kind of explain both camps because, because I think it's valuable as a community to recognize there are areas of gray. Yeah. And so recognize we are stepping into the gray a little bit, and there is space in which you can land in either camp and there can still be community between us. So camp one is a permissible service. This first camp believes that Jesus' words here apply specifically to interpersonal oaths. So if you are called upon to perform a public service for the good of your neighbor, then oath-taking is permissible. So political office, military service, courtroom witness, jury, all become permissible applications assuming you are committed to truth and the good of your neighbor. So all of this underpinning is still a commitment to truth. This is a pragmatic and hands-on approach to being the people of God. That there are some moments in which we have to step into a world of lies to be truth. So the first camp is there is permissible exemptions for the sake of our neighbor to this. The second camp I describe as a holy refusal because Jesus, these, this camp believes that Jesus' words forbid the taking of all oaths. For if we are now citizens of the kingdom of God, as Paul refers to us, what obligation do we have to the rulers of our day? And this is an interpretation of a holy refusal that can put Christians in conflict with the political structures of our day. This perspective on the outset seems unreasonable, but those who would adhere to it would call our attention to corruption, dishonesty, and exploitation that exist within almost all governmental structures. This holy refusal suggests that we best bear witness to Christ when we refuse to partner with corruption on any level. It is an idealistic and lofty vision of the kingdom of God set against the powers of our day. And it's worth noting that the first inter interpretation of a permissible service has kind of been the leading um, interpretation for the last thousand years or so. And the first of a holy refusal was the primary interpretation for the first 300 years after Jesus. Um, and in the coming weeks, we'll explore a little bit more of the early church and their politic. But it's worth noting that there are two camps, and that there's actually probably a great deal of value in Christians exercising both camps. That we need faithful Christians stepping into corrupt structures, calling for truth and the good of our neighbor. And then we also need Christians standing on the outset saying in a prophetic voice, we need to do better and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. We need both to bear witness to truth. And I think the application of both of those things, regardless of where you lie on the spectrum, is that followers of Christ must bravely question the actions of our government. If you are of the first interpretation, you must ask all the probing questions to determine whether truth and the welfare of your neighbor is truly being exercised. If you're of the first opinion of permissible service, you need to have a whole list of questions that go into, should I take this oath because is there a true commitment to truth here? 
And if you're of the second, you will always be at odds with the powers that be because I've never heard a government that loves to be told no. <laughs> you will always be in tension with the governmental structures. Dale Bruner comments on this command of Jesus and says, taking it seriously may make his disciples politically salty. I love that. I have a feeling that the command that Jesus gives, among other reasons, is in order to make disciples always question the state and their relation to it. This command is not as irrelevant as it first seems. And so, so while the public application is that we should be in a posture of questioning and challenging to make sure truth and the good of our neighbor are being followed, there is a little bit of a murky water in how it goes about being applied specifically. But there's probably room for gray. While the public application has some gray, the interpersonal application is crystal clear. Jesus demands that we are people of integrity and committed to simple honesty. Um, Dallas Willard, in his work, The Divine Conspiracy, which we have quoted at nauseum. So, at this point, you've somewhat read it because we keep quoting it, in part because it's one of my favorite works on the Sermon on the Mount. Dallas Willard, in his chapter on this command, writes, The essence of swearing that Jesus targets here is about invoking something or someone else, especially God, to make your words seem more significant and weighty. The aim is to impress others with your seriousness or piety so that you get what you want. It is a device of manipulation designed to override the judgment or input of others in order to possess them for our purposes. It's manipulation, or as we say in our culture, spin. And Jesus says it's evil. Instead of loving and honoring others with truthfulness, the intent is to get one's way by verbal manipulation of the thoughts and choices of others. Jesus compels us to reject the culture of spin and manipulation and to be people committed to simple, straightforward honesty. If the band would join me back on the stage, we'll kind of bring this to a close. This commitment to Jesus' ethic of simple honesty has so many applications I didn't know where to begin. Because if you reflect on this even for the briefest of moments, you, your own heart and your own actions will begin to betray you pretty quickly. This means that when we say, I will be there, we will be there and not bail on people the day of or hours before when we are committed to being a community of truth, that when we commit to people for responsibility, that we follow through with what is expected of us. It means that we should work to not be known as flaky, inconsistent, or unreliable. It means that we don't invoke the name of God, Jesus, or Spirit to hide from accountability or questions. For who can question you if you said, God told me so? It means that we are committed to telling the truth, even if it means pain or conflict. And if I'm honest, no pun intended, I thought this would be an easy command to check off. I genuinely stepped into studying this moment to go, I, I tell the truth a lot. And the more I reflected on it, the more my own heart betrayed me. The more I thought about it, the more I became aware of subtle misdirec misdirections that I perpetrate every day. I'm more aware of how I dodge questions with the ambiguous answers. How I use my intellect and education to dodge a straightforward question to avoid the conflict. I do everything I can to make sure you all like me through subtle misdirections, through avoiding questions, through not telling the whole of the truth. And I find myself 
condemned as one who constantly spins my own image for you. I've made a habit of managing, curating, and manipulating how others see me. And yet my desire to be fully known, in Jesus' own words, challenge almost every interaction I have throughout the day. That on the surface, this seems like something Christians should have it easy. We are people of truth, and yet we are still captured by a culture of sin. We are still captured by a culture in which we slightly distort images of ourselves in order that others would like us better, in order that we can avoid the conflict or the pain that comes from straight. into a place of honesty with one another. To recognize for us to be fully known requires that we be a truth-telling people. May the people gathered in this room be known for their commitment to honesty in whatever may follow. And that means that we engage in hard conversations because we're not afraid to tell the truth. And even if we are afraid, we do it anyway. That we would be a people that refuse to manipulate another. That we rather honor them with the whole truth. And though it's been said and quoted so many times, it's ad nauseum in culture, that I think the truth will set us free. That in being people committed to truth, we don't have to spend hours and time thinking about how we might be perceived that we just allow ourselves to be seen and to be known. And as we wrap up this moment and this reflection, we always strive to give a spiritual practice, something that we can immediately grapple with and we can immediately move from that's a great idea into a habit that embodies the nature of this kind of and the first one is pretty simple. Just make a commitment to the truth. But again, upon further reflection, that is far more difficult than what it initially sounds like. Honestly, most of us do not have the courage to be committed fully to the truth. And so I think one of the ways we can learn to be more honest is by beginning with our relationship with God. That if we can learn to be honest with our heavenly who refuses to give up on us no matter what the cost. If we can learn to take our brokenness, our sinfulness, our mismanaged expectations, our heartbreak, our disgust with our actions, if we can learn to take all of those things to the throne room of God, I think we might find in ourselves the bravery and courage to be honest with ourselves and within this community. So here's my God, would you bash their heads against the rock? Would you break their back because it came out of a place of such brutal anger that it acknowledges the depths of human suffering, that it acknowledges our own woundedness, and it takes it to God? Here's my encouragement. Begin to pray through the Psalms. They have long been known as the prayer book of the church, and that's in part because they cover every emotion that you could possibly imagine. And if you can begin to recognize that the psalmist was as bold to make claims of God, I want you to murder that person. You can begin to recognize that he is probably okay with your disdain for that co-worker. That he is big enough to handle your own insecurities. That if we can begin to pray the psalms, we will discover a God that is unwilling to abandon us. Stanley Howard Watts says it this way, the Psalms are the great prayer book of the church because they teach us to pray without intention. The 
Psalms allow us to rage against God and in our rage discover God's refusal to abandon us. The Psalms, moreover, train us to speak truthfully because they force us to acknowledge our sins or at least to have our sins revealed. He's in the midst of it. 